good to welcome everyone tonight. It's good to be together on a Sunday evening uh, to come and worship the Lord, to acknowledge His goodness and His grace to us. So many reasons to thank Him this evening. I don't know whether you feel that in your heart or not, but it's true nonetheless. We've got many, many reasons to praise the Lord and give thanks to Him, rejoice in all that He is and all that He's done. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. Let's pray together as we come. Lord our God, here we are again gathering in your presence together. Thankful for another Sunday evening, another opportunity to gather, but so conscious, Lord, of our need of you, our need of your help need of your presence, the need of the help of the Holy Spirit as we come to worship you tonight. It's so easy for us to just turn up and go through the motions and we don't want that to be true of us tonight. We want to meet with you and hunger for you and rejoice in you and sing your praise and proclaim the good news of your salvation. So Lord God, help us this evening, uh, we pray and meet with us and do us good. We thank you that there's a, a way for us to come, a way that it's sure and true and Uh, we can come with confidence and with boldness and with gladness this evening because we come in the name of Jesus Christ the one who is our saviour wonderful glorious saviour the one who's who's done everything for us and been everything that we have not been and and then died in our place and we thank you Lord that through him and through his mighty resurrection from the dead we can We can know you and come to you and rejoice in you this evening. So bless us, Lord. Help us, we pray. Be with us tonight. We're looking to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Let's sing together then. 746. 746. Oh, Jesus Christ, the Savior, we only look to thee. Tis in thy love and favor our souls find liberty. While Satan fiercely rages and shipwreck oft we fear, Tis this our grief assages that thou art always near. 746.
it's good to be reminded in those words that though we're in the midst of the battle now, uh, a day is coming when we'll be with the Lord and we'll be looking back and seeing how the Lord used it all and was in it all and overruled it all uh, for, for our good and for his glory. Well, we're going to read God's word together now. We're back in Ezra this evening, so the book of Ezra. Uh, we're looking tonight at chapter 7 and 8. Uh, we read chapter 7 last week. I'm going to just read a few verses from it. And then we're going to go to chapter 8. And I'm going to read part of that as well. Leaving out a few names. So Ezra chapter 7. Uh, verse 1 introduces us to Ezra and uh, his uh, genealogy. The, the family that he comes from. I want to begin to read at verse 8. So Ezra 7 verse 8. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. And then there follows that letter. We read it last week, verse 12 down, where Artaxerxes the king uh, says people can return to Jerusalem, the Jews can go back, and there's promise of help and, and uh, gold and so on. Amazing letter. And uh, then we'll take up the reading again in verse 27. And this is Ezra speaking now. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counselor and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. So I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. These are the heads of their father's houses. And this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. The sons of Phinehas, Gershom. Of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel. The sons of David, Hattush. And so it goes on uh, down to verse 14. And then we'll take up the reading again in verse 15. Now I gathered them by the river that flows to Ahava, and we camped there three days. And I looked among the people and, um, and the priests and found none of the sons of Levi there. Then I sent for Eliza, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jarib, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, leaders. Also for Joyarib and El Nathan, men of understanding, and I gave them a command for Ido, the chief man at the place Casiphia, that, uh, and I told them what they should say to Ido and his brethren the Nethanim in the place Casiphia, that they should bring us servants for the house of our gods. Then, by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi. Uh, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, and his sons and brothers, 18 men, and Hashabiah, uh, uh, and with him Jeshiah, of the sons of Merari, his brothers and their sons, 20 men. Also of the Nethanim, who David and his leaders had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim. All of them were designated by name. Then I proclaimed a fast there by the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our, our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us because of the enemies on the road, because, against the enemy on the road, because we had spoken to the king, saying, The good hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. And I separated twelve of the leaders of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brethren with them, and weighed out to them the silver, the gold, and the articles 
the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his princes and all Israel who were present had offered. I weighed into their hands 650 talents of silver, silver articles weighing 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 gold basins worth 1,000 drachmas, and two vessels of fine polished bronze, precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord. The articles are holy also. And the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leaders of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel in Jerusalem, in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites received the silver and the gold and the articles by weight to bring them to Jerusalem, to the house of our God. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from the ambush along the roads. So we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. Now on the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the articles were weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Meramoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, and with him Eliezer, the son of Phinehas. Uh, with them were the Levites, Josabad, uh, the son of Jeshua, and Odiah, the son of Binu, with the number and weight of everything. All the weight was written down at that time. The children of those who had been carried away captive, who had come from the captivity, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 69, not, sorry, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and 12 male goats as a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. And they delivered the king's orders to the king's satraps and the governors in the region beyond the river. So they gave support to the people and the house of God. Again, we've read God's word. Great variety in God's word, isn't there? For us and things for us to learn and uh, pray that God will help us as we look at that in a little while. Let's take up our hymn books now. We're going to sing from our supplement, um, number 39 in the supplement. It's always good, isn't it, to, to remind ourselves to be still, to trust the Lord in all the circumstances of our lives, to remember the Lord is, is true and trustworthy. And as we trust in him, he will keep us still. My soul be still. And do not fear, though winds of change may rage tomorrow. God is at your side. No longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow. Let's sing 39.
some time in prayer together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, as we bow in your presence, we acknowledge together we don't find it easy always to be still and to trust you and not to fear. Uh, we find it hard not to be anxious. Uh, we find it hard not to try and sort everything out in our own strength and our own wisdom and we pray Lord God tonight for, for a stillness in our hearts for a, a trust in you uh, for a willingness to, to submit to you and to rest in your good purposes in our lives Lord, we, we thank you that you are a mighty God. We acknowledge that you've, you've been true to all your promises. You've kept us and you've not failed us. Lord, at times you've taken us through, and perhaps for some here tonight, are taking them through difficult times, mysterious times. And it's hard, and the way seems dark and perplexing and and yet, Lord God, we pray that we might trust you. you you've kept us so far. You've, you've watched over us. Here we are this evening in your presence. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to keep us. Lord, we, we've, we've spoken to ourselves in, in the words of this hymn. Do not forsake the truth that you learned in the beginning. Lord, help us not to turn away from you. Keep us faithful to you. Keep us true to the gospel, uh, Lord, that you are the God who, who works all things out. So we ask that you will help us, Lord, in all the circumstances of our lives, and that you'll keep us and watch over us and have your hand upon us. Lord, we commit this coming week to you, uh, Lord, uh, and ask for your help and your grace and your strength. Uh, Lord, as we go about our daily lives, we think of our uh, young people, children going back to school, I uh, pray that you'll be with them, our teachers and, and uh, TAs, the helpers. Lord, we just commit them to you. Uh, you'll be with them and give them daily grace and strength. Uh, Lord, uh, for those who have exams, we pray for Susanna. She has her exams, uh, final exams this week. Give her the wisdom and the help and the grace uh, that she needs, Lord. Uh, we thank you for answered prayers in many different ways uh, for us as a people, the ways you've kept us uh, and watched over us and answer prayers thank you for Vicky's uh, growing strength after her operation we just commit her to you pray that you will continue to watch over her and be with her uh, Lord we ask that you will help us then as we as we head out into this week that we might do so with a sense of uh, your presence with us with a joy of the Lord in our hearts uh, Lord with a with a with a trust in you a willingness to, to stand for you and speak for you uh, that you will help us and watch over us. Oh, Lord God, we pray. Uh, Lord, we, we again thank you that we are so blessed in the peace and the safety that we enjoy. We've come here tonight. We haven't really thought about, about it in that sense. And, and yet, again, we're conscious that we have brothers and sisters who are in real need and difficulty, persecution tonight. And, Lord, we often remember them in prayer, but we pray that, Lord, we might... We might do that with a with a sense of uh, unity with them and a sense of real burden for them lord we know that if we were going through times of deep persecution we would want brothers and sisters in other places to be praying for us and so lord we remember them uh, this evening brothers and sisters around the world uh, we think of those who've been saved out of uh, muslim homes where they've been uh, rejected by their families and uh, live in threat often and we ask that you will be with them and watch over them uh, lord those who are in in countries where where they're in the minority and they're persecuted and troubled we, lord we ask that you will have mercy upon them our brothers and sisters in prison tonight lord uh, that you would uphold them and sustain them uh, give them that stillness of which we've sung uh, in the midst of their in their prison cells that they would be have that peace and that joy and that knowledge that they're in your hands and that you are their God and they're not forsaken oh Lord may they know that uh, this evening we pray think of all that's going on around the world we oh, think of that 
a terrible train accident in India and all those who've been affected by it, those who are grieving. Lord, we're conscious of the brokenness of our world and how quickly people's lives are turned upside down and swept away. Oh, Lord, have mercy, we pray. Areas of the world where there's war and trouble, we think of all that's going on in Ukraine still. Oh, Lord, we long for peace there. For our, think of all that's happening to our brothers and sisters. As Thank you for the, for the courage that many of them are showing and seeking to help other people and reach out and those who are seeking to be pastors to the soldiers, Lord, uh, help and have mercy, we pray. But bring an end to that war and uh, with all its trouble and all its politics, Lord, so much that we don't understand and, and can't have any impact on ourselves. But, you, Lord, we're going to be reminded this evening that you are the God who has kings in your hands and you turn them whichever way you wish. So we commit this to you, Lord our God, tonight. Thank you for your word, Lord, these chapters we've read together. Please speak to us, help me in preaching and all of us in hearing. Uh, that we're, There'll be things that will speak to us and challenge us and be helpful for us and that we'll be able to take away into the week and, and put into practice in our lives, Lord, that we might not simply be hearers of your word but doers of it also. Oh, Lord, we pray. So bless us, Lord. Uh, watch over us. Keep us. Have your hand upon us. Those who we know and love who are in need this evening, we uh, we remember them. We remember, we remember Richard, uh, Paul's dad, back in hospital. Pray for him. Uh, pray for Andrea at home that you will just give her a sense of your peace in her heart as well. And give, uh, give help and, 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 and wisdom to Paul and Sarah uh, too as they seek to, to care and, and uh, be with them, we pray. Lord of God, we just commit ourselves to you now then. Ask that you will continue with us and watch over us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing once more before we come to God's word. Number 49, this time in the supplement. Number 49, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labours increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. So let's sing together 49.
Okay, let's turn to Ezra chapter 7 and 8. Ezra chapter 7 and 8. And uh, I'm glad to sing those words before we turn to it. Uh, that reminder of when we've reached the end of our resources, God's resources are there for us. I feel the need of that this evening. So, uh, last week we finally met Ezra. Uh, 80 years after uh, the book of Ezra begins, Ezra finally appears on the scene. And Jerusalem and Judah are in great need of him, actually. Uh, 80 years. 80 years earlier, those first exiles had, had returned home to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Uh, they began to rebuild the temple, you remember. Then, because of trouble, 16 years passes and, uh, and, uh, and the work's left. And it's not until the preaching that we saw, don't we, of Haggai and Zechariah stirring up the people that the work once more uh, starts and the temple is completed. And then between chapters 6 and 7, you remember, there's a period of 57 years. And during that time, there's, there's spiritual decline in Judah. There's been, there's been apathy. There's been a coldness. Uh, it's descended. Worldliness has returned. Uh, the people have forgotten the, the distinctness, the separation between the supposed to mark the people of God out. And there's a great need then for someone to come and bring them back to the word of God and bring them back to the ways of God's. And Ezra is that man. Ezra is that man for the task. And so last week we saw, didn't we, the way in which Ezra's prepared himself uh, uh, for this task. He's prepared himself. We, particularly last week, we just looked at one verse, if you remember, chapter 7 and verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel so he set himself he's got this task ahead of him and he's set himself to to to, to look at God's word and seek God's word and we said and we whenever there's any true advance in the work of God always at the heart of it is the word of God always the case and uh, and so that's why we we were thinking last week we need to be people of the book we need to be people who read our Bibles and live in the light of them so we had those four points, didn't we, last week? They're there, I think, aren't they, on the, on the top of the sheet? Yeah, if you remember from that verse, preparing, seeking, obeying, teaching. That's what Ezra does, doesn't he, in that verse. He prepares his heart to look at God's word. He seeks God's word. He wants to know it. He wants to understand it. He wants to find Christ in it. And then he obeys it because he knows it's not no good just reading it and knowing it. He's got to do it. And then he wants to pass it on. He wants to teach it. He wants, he wants, he wants, it's in his heart. And now he wants to make it known. And we said that those are things that are tr- going to be true of us. So I, wonder, I wonder what a difference it made from last Sunday night. Were you here last Sunday night? What, did it make any difference to your Bible reading this week? We said, didn't we? There's no point being just hearers of the word. We've got to be doers of it too. But now Ezra's got to get to Jerusalem then. So he's, he's, in, he's in Babylon uh, and he's got to get to Jerusalem to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do this work. And he's got to, uh, want to take this long journey. And that's what we learn about in these two chapters then, chapters 7 and 8. We know the journey's about 1,000 miles, okay? And we know from chapter 7, verse 9, look, that it takes them four months to do. I mean, that's quite something, isn't it? Uh, perhaps put some of our holiday journeys in perspective, doesn't it? Uh, perhaps next time you're stuck on the M5 or something like that in a queue, you, remember, you can remember this journey and think, well, perhaps this isn't quite so much. So we're going to think about this journey tonight then. And we've got three headings. We've got uh, preparations and people and protection. And uh, how it looks on the sheet is how it is, hopefully, in reality, that uh, the first point is the longest point, and the second two are much shorter. Uh, when I was at Bible College, I was told that all points should be roughly the same length, and I think that's probably a good principle, uh, but it doesn't always work out like that. So don't despair when we get to the end of the first point. Uh, preparations, that's the first thing then, okay? Journeys need preparation. And long journeys, significant journeys need to be prepared for. So I want us to think about God's preparations and then Ezra's preparation. So first of all, God's preparations. It's clear that God prepares the way for this journey. First of all, we see his hand on the king. So I didn't read it this week, but we read it last week, verses 12 uh, of chapter 7 through to 26. There's an astonishing letter written from King Artaxerxes 
he basically issues a decree stating that any of the remaining Jews who want to go back to Jerusalem to help with the work on the temple on the city with the worship of God can go back he sends huge amounts of gold and precious items for the work and to support it he gives an ongoing allowance he exempts all those involved in the work on the temple and in the temple he gives them an exemption from taxes and gives them authority to to deal with anyone who stands in their way that's basically what that letter is and you'd think the letters come from a Christian leader not a pagan emperor and we say however does that come about what's come over King Artaxerxes well I'm sure we could think about various things Artaxerxes has both Ezra and Nehemiah in his court and among his chief men so no, I'm sure their godly lives made an impression, just like you young people remember um, uh, Daniel has on Darius and, uh, and so on. Then Artaxerxes is the son of Ahasuerus, or Exerxes, who had married Esther and was involved in all that happened with Mordecai and Haman. You remember that story? Well, I'm sure that Artaxerxes would have known about that, wouldn't he? But there's an ultimate reason why he does this, and we're told it in verse 27 of chapter 7. Look at verse 27 of chapter 7. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem, and has extended mercy to me before the king and his counsellors. So this has happened, ultimately, because the Lord has put it in King Artaxerxes' heart to do it. So that though the king does it freely, though the king does it of his own will, he's not forced. It's not like when you want to get the children to clean their bedroom or something, you have to push them up the stairs, they don't want to go. I mean, he does it freely, he does it willingly, but, but he does it ultimately because God puts it in his heart to do it. Remember Proverbs 21 verse 1? What does Proverbs 21 verse 1 say? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Look back at chapter 7 verse 12. How does Artaxerxes uh, introduce himself? Do you see that in verse 12, chapter 12? Artaxerxes, king of kings, he says, doesn't he? Oh, there's only one king of kings. And Artaxerxes is in his hand, isn't he? And doing his will. And we, we need to remember that, don't we? Rishi Sunak, Joe Biden, Vladimir Putin. We could go around them all, couldn't we? Kim Ong, Jong-un, the North Korean president. None of them really acknowledge God, do they? And yet they're all in the hands of God who sovereignly rules the nations and does so ultimately for the good of his people and the glory of his name. There's confidence, there's, 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 uh, there's encouragement for us in that tonight. So we see God's preparation, his hand on, on the king, but we also see his hand on, on Ezra as well. So uh, he says, doesn't he, in, in verse verse 28 of the of of chapter 7 so i was encouraged as the hand of the lord my god was upon me so god's got his hand on him we've seen that already haven't we in this in this chapter in verse 6 it's there at the end of verse 6 according to the hand of the lord his god upon him it's there in verse 9 again according to the good hand of his god upon him so God is working in Ezra, on Ezra. He's got his hand on him. He's shaping him. He's fashioning him. He's giving him wisdom. He's, he's forming his character. He's giving him favor in the eyes of the king. All that we thought about last week as, as Ezra prepares his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. and That's all God's hand on him, shaping him, making him the man he was so that he's ready for this moment. The Lord's preparing Ezra and the encouraging thing the Lord is always preparing his people preparing people for his work pastors teachers missionaries but also as we'll think in a while those working behind the scenes those doing the nitty gritty stuff that nobody notices and goes unappreciated but is so important for the work of the Lord so 
the second half of verse 28 of verse chapter 7 says so I was encouraged Ezra's Ezra's strengthened as he can see the heart, that God's preparing the way that God's preparing the heart of the king and, and God's got his hand on him and he's encouraged to go on true strength from these truths God is sovereign God's got the king in his hands and he's got everything under his control and he's working out his purposes so we see God's preparations for the journey but we also see Ezra's preparations for the journey and as, what did it involve? Well, it involved, first of all, gathering the people. So at the end of verse 28, so again in chapter 7 still, uh, he says, I was encouraged as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. Now we're going to think a little bit more about the people uh, in the next point, but it's clear that this decree goes out from the king, and then Ezra is speaking to, to people and gathering them in and encouraging them to come and, and be involved in the work. Uh, in a group of people, there always needs to be leaders, doesn't there? There needs to be, uh, needs to be organizers and there needs to be encouragers. And, and that's what Ezra is. So look at chapter 8, verse 15. Now I gathered them by the river that flows to a harbor. So Ezra's involved. Let's, 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 let's stop here. Let's get this. Everyone stop here. Let's all gather here. Let's, let's wait here. Let's camp here for, t- for three days. And, uh, and he's clearly looking, isn't he? He looks among the people. He's, he's working out who's there, who's not there, who ought to be there. And he realizes there's no Levites there. So he, so he sends people to, to, to go and get some. So uh, he's preparing the ways he gathers the people. Uh, and he uses wisdom in doing that and encouragement in doing that. Some people need, uh, you know, some are more willing, some are a bit more reluctant and hesitant. Some have to be pushed, don't they? And Ezra shows wisdom in gathering the people. So what did is, what is this Ezra's preparations involve? It involved gathering the people, but it also involved seeking the lords. So now we'll look at, we're in verse 21 of chapter 8. So the people gather together at Harvah, uh, ready to begin the journey, but they're not ready to begin yet, because before they go, Ezra proclaims a fast. Let's just spend a bit of time thinking about this. So he, I proclaimed a fast there at the river of a harbor what is what is fasting well fasting is uh, it's most basic going without food isn't it? abstaining from food for a period of time what's the purpose of it well it's to give yourself uh, for that time more fully to seek god it's it's uh, it's a way of saying seeking god is the most important thing in my life at this moment it's it matters more than my daily food. It matters more than anything else. It matters more than necessities of life. It's, it's a way of showing God that we're serious about seeking him. It's, uh, it helps focus, doesn't it? We're, we're going to leave aside the, the necessities of life and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna give ourselves to seek God. Uh, it it it's, it's can't really be separated from prayer, can it? Prayer and fasting really go together. They, we'll see that in a moment. They, they're, they're entreating the Lord. They're going together. It, it's, it's not a... It's not an end in itself. It's not, it's not a way of sort of twisting God's arm. Uh, you know, it's not a way of earning God's favor. By, well, you know, we haven't got it yet. Let's, let's fast and see if we can earn God's favor. But it's, it's, it's so that you can give yourself to prayer. We see here, I think, three reasons why uh, Ezra and the people fasted. Look at them. Look, look at them with me. Verse 21. Uh, we proclaim to fast there but at the river of Ahava. Why? What does it say? that we might humble ourselves before our God. So that's the first thing. So, we, so, so they fasted so that they could humble. Them. And what does humbling yourself in, before God involve? Well, it involves acknowledging your sin, doesn't it? And your unworthiness and your, and your confessing your shortcomings and turning from your sins and casting yourself upon him and acknowledging your weakness and your frailty and your needs. Lord, we can't do without you. It involves turning from self-confidence and pride and saying Lord you are God and we're, we're your people and we need you so it involved humbling themselves uh, so they fasted in order to seek the Lord's guidance as well didn't they look at how verse 21 goes on uh, to humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions so they got a big decision to make how were they going to travel should they ask for the king's 
protection. Which way should they go? And so with this big decision to make and wanting to know the Lord's guidance, they fasted and prayed. And, and you find that in the New Testament, don't you? At times, when they've got big decisions, when the church is thinking about setting aside Paul and Barnabas, Acts 13 verse 2, they fasted and prayed. When Barnabas and Paul and Barnabas appoint elders, they fast and pray as they think about doing that. And, and that's hap often happened in times where churches have been in need or have big decisions to make. They go, let's fast and pray. And that's thirdly, what we see look down at verse 23 they fasted in order to entreat the Lord so we fasted and entreated our God for this and he answered our prayer so that's a strong word it's petition it's crying out it's a sense of need they wanted God's help they wanted God's presence they wanted God's protection they knew that they, this journey ahead was too big for them and, 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 and dangerous and they can't do without the Lord and so they plead with him this is a seriousness this is an earnestness now of course we know from the New Testament don't we we the Lord says, you know, when you fast, don't, don't make a big show of it. Uh, but I wonder whether, we, whether, whether we've thought about this enough, whether, whether we do fast. Uh, we, live, we live with such luxury, don't we? Um, uh, I wonder whether, whether this is something we ought to be more thoughtful of. It's sort of, it's, you know, it's not something in our circles, really, is it, so much. But in many, places, many churches... When a big decision comes, when there's a time of crisis, a time of disunity, uh, awareness of, of lack of blessing. I think it's something that we as elders perhaps need to talk about. I wonder whether we do that individually, whether we're ever, whether we're ever sort of serious enough about our Christianity or about something or a decision or something to go, well, let's, let's stop let's fast let's go Lord this matters more than anything else we're going to seek you so what did preparing Ezra's preparations involve gathering the people organizing that they needed a leader and then saying first thing he says well before we go don't go any further let's let's fast let's seek the Lord let's look for his blessing and then it involved also trusting the Lord didn't it verse that's verse 22 so one of the reasons for seeking the Lord was because Ezra felt that it wasn't right to ask the king for, a, for an escort of horses and chariots and soldiers to protect them on the way. It's clear, isn't it, from verse 22. Uh, let me read it again. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we'd spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So clearly, Ezra's been speaking to the king about how great God is and how much you can trust him and how, how, how he protects his people and looks after them and defends them. And so he clearly feels now, well, it'd be a bit inconsistent to say, and by the way, can you give us a small army to help us on our way to, you know, that, that doesn't sound very uh, dishonoring to the Lord and uh, lacking of faith. Now, we, we have to be a bit careful about this because... Um, you can't make rules and be too dogmatic about it because if you turn over to Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 9 we discover that when Nehemiah travels that same journey a few years later he's given an armed guard and, and he takes it so um, when I went then I went to the governors of the, in the region beyond the river and they, they gave, and gave them the king's letter now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me now, it's a bit different because it, it, it doesn't seem that Nehemiah asked for it. But when the king gives it, Nehemiah is thankful for it. But clearly, Ezra doesn't, you know, doesn't want to ask. He wants to trust the Lord. And if the Lord had wanted him to have an escort, well, he would have put it in the king's heart to give him an escort. So he's going to have to step out in faith, isn't he? Uh, words are cheap in some ways isn't it it's alright yeah our God is a great God he looks after his people and cares for them it's, it's so easy to say that and then you've got to put it into practice haven't you by heading out on this journey without anyone with you I mean and we, in a sense we shouldn't be surprised that he's a man of faith and he does that why shouldn't we be surprised he's a man of faith 
Well, because he's a man of the word, isn't he? We've seen that already. Chapter 7, verse 10. He's a man who, who knows the Bible and reads the Bible and, and seeks the Lord. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, doesn't it? Hearing by the word of God. So do, you want, do we want to be men and women of faith? We want to be men and women with a confidence in God? What have we got to do? Sort of try and muster it up? No, we've got to open our Bibles and read it. Because what did Ezra read? Well, he would have read about how God had kept his people through the wilderness, wouldn't he? And how God had been with his people and watched over his people and kept them from their enemies. And he, said, and he thinks, well, our God can do that now. So well, that's how we've got to live, haven't we? You know, yes, we've got to tell people about the greatness of our God and, uh, and his goodness and how he keeps us and watches over us, but we've got to show that, haven't we, in our lives? So, preparations for the journey. That's what we see here. God's preparations, Ezra's preparations. I mean, both are needed, aren't they, in in God's work? We need God to be at work. We need his hand upon us. We need him to deal with us. We need him to prepare the way and and go before us. But at the same time, we've got a work to do, haven't we? As we gather ourselves together and as we seek him and as we give ourselves, we trust him, we go out in faith. Both are needed. So there's the first one, preparations. Secondly, people. Let's just spend a bit of time thinking about the people. Uh, first of all, there's not so many people this time. On that first return at the beginning of the book, some 80 years earlier, about 50,000 people returned. That must have seemed like a pretty good, pretty good number, mustn't it? 50,000? I mean, that's nearly twice the capacity of Carrow Road. <laughs> All, the, all those people, you can imagine it. That might help some of you think of how many that was. But this time around, we're told about 1,496 males. And then a few more are added. There's 12 families mentioned in that first part of chapter 8. Now there, there are wives and children, so it's going to be a few thousand. But that's, that's not that many. Even though the king said, anyone who wants to can, can head back. And it's not, I don't think there's just only a few left in Babylon. There were plenty who didn't come back the first time, and now we're 80 years on, and so two or three generations on with expanding families. I haven't seen that many this time. Now, we said that we, when we thought about that first return, it's going to be hard, isn't it? It's going to be, it's going to involve uprooting your family and involve uncertainty. It's going to involve hardship, and, and we're now 80 years further down the line, so none of these people or their parents or perhaps even their grandparents had ever seen Jerusalem and then and they're settled and then they probably heard back from Jerusalem that actually the people who've gone there it's been pretty tough and it's not been very glamorous and and it's you know it's hard work and uh, it just seems that there's not that many and sometimes it can seem a bit like that, can't it? Only, a, only a, it's not that many Christians who are prepared to really give themselves to the Lord and his work and whatever the cost. And, and it's a challenge for us this evening in that. And they're not all keen. I, I put down not, not all such keen people. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? But So actually, of those who go some do seem more keen to volunteer than others we don't know all the details so when you know as I said when they first gather at that place then uh, Ezra looks around and there's none of the Levites and so they have to be sent for don't they and pushed a bit more and then they do come Sherebiah and Hashabiah and Jeshiah they 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 come with their and it's a reminder isn't it that, that that some are more willing to put themselves forward, some are more willing to volunteer, others do have to be encouraged, don't they? Asked, pushed a bit. Some are more reluctant. And sometimes that's character, isn't it? And, and we have to understand people's character and some are more hesitant than others and feel more inadequate than others. But it's, yeah, it's just another reminder of this. Some are keener than others, aren't they? Let's think about some very necessary people 
Let's talk about the Nethanim for a while, for a moment, shall we? They're mentioned in verse 17 and verse 20. It sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds like a group from Star Trek or something, doesn't it? Uh, the word actually means the given ones. And we see in verse 20, look, that they were, they were a group of people who were not actually Levites, but they served alongside the Levites and were there to help the Levites fulfill their duties, help with all the behind-the-scenes work and all the preparation work in the temple. So these people were, were needed. It's often, that's often, isn't it, the people who are up front get all the attention and all the praise. But in a church, there's, there's so often so many people who do lots of things, aren't there, behind lots of work that goes on. That's, they're just needed, isn't it, for things to run smoothly. In a sense, the deacons are a bit like the Nethanim, aren't they? Dealing with all the practical matters in order that those who... Give them, can give themselves to ministry of the word can do that perhaps we ought, I was thinking we could perhaps we ought to call our deacons nethanim instead of it's more interesting wouldn't it to, uh, to call them that we have nethanim meetings and things so there's these people who give themselves to that and, and of course and uh, yeah of course we're all to be like that really aren't we we're all to be deacons we're all servants and the reason for that is because of what we're reminded in verse 28 so chapter 8 verse 28 uh, Ezra gives gold and precious articles to some of the people who are to, to look after responsible for on the journey for it and he reminds them doesn't he in verse 28 um, I said to them you are holy to the Lord the articles are holy also so what does he mean by that he says well in the same he means that in the same way these articles are for the temple are set aside for God so you are you're, 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 you're set aside for God you're his for his service to live for him and that's true of all believers isn't it we're believers here tonight we're a holy people we're a set apart for the Lord Peter speaks to us about believers being a holy nation that doesn't mean we're perfect but it means you've been set apart for God for his service for him you're his servant your life isn't your own anymore it's the Lord's and, and faithfulness in serving giving, giving ourselves to serve often comes as we realize that don't we we're, our lives aren't our own we've been bought with a price we're, we're set aside people the Lord's taken us and he's set us aside for himself well we better live like that then and yet we often we have to admit don't we often the battle is we want to live our lives for our own for ourselves and do our own thing and then, and then give a little bit to the Lord when we've done all we want to do So there's a little bit about the people to challenge us, to encourage us, to give ourselves to the Lord. And then lastly, just the protection is the last thing. Protection. Verse 31, look. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the way it's that expression again the hand of the Lord now it's not just on Ezra is it it's on it's on all this people now just go back to verse 22 for a moment and what the, what Ezra said to the king there who's the hand of the Lord upon the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him you see that a reminder of those who know the good hand of the Lord upon it are those who, who? Those who seek the Lord. It's interesting. It's not just those who seek, uh, seek good from him or seek his protection, but those who seek him. You see that? Those who seek him, those who desire him, those who long for him, those who say, Lord, I want you, I want to know you, I want to walk with you. It's those that the hand of the Lord is upon. So do you want to know the hand of the Lord on you? Well, here's something you can do. Seek him. Seek him. Say, early in the morning, I will seek you, Lord. My long for him. Lay hold of him. Say, I won't let you go until you bless me. Well, back in verse 31 then, it's the good hand of the Lord that brings them safely on this journey. Incredible journey. All that way, all those miles, walking, all those people, all those dangers, all those threats, all those enemies. And 
and yet God's hand is upon him and keeps them and protects them and watches over them. And that's the explanation for all these chapters, isn't it? The hand of the Lord is on them to keep them. And we can trust him, can't we? We can go to him and look to him. He's our God still and he's got his hand on us and he will keep us and he will protect us. And he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So there's things for us to learn from this chapter, things for us to be challenged by, things for us to be encouraged by things for us to take out into this week and to live for his glory let's sing as we finish shall we we're going to sing 755 755 lovely hymn of John Newton be gone unbelief my saviour is near and for my relief will surely appear by prayer let me wrestle and he will perform with Christ in the vessel. I smile at the storm. So we're singing, well, we're singing to the Lord, but we're singing to ourselves and reminding ourselves of these truths and encouraging ourselves to trust him. So let's sing 755. <laughs> Lord, we pray then that for that faith to trust you in all our ways. You are the God who is the God of Ezra, our God too. Oh Lord, may your hand be upon us. May we know you leading us and guiding us and keeping us. Help us to trust you. Help us to seek you. Lord, help us to learn from this chap these chapters we pray tonight. So Lord, watch over us now. Thank you for fellowship together, opportunity to talk together. Pray that you'll be with us and bless us and take us home in peace and safety, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.